Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hello. Starting, we didn't know if we could start on time, but we are. Oh. Uh, enjoying the day. Yeah. Yeah. Awfully cool. I wish it was warm up a little bit. My name is Lyle Bradley, and uh, I have been very lucky. I went through two wars, both World War II and Korea. And uh, there's a guy sitting right back here uh, by the name of D.N. Smith. He went through the same thing. So I brought him over here so he can correct me on all the errors that I made. And, uh, so here I'll, uh, you can be stand by. We're going to start. I'm going to give you a, a Korean word, a statement, and see if you can pronounce it. It's called Wagarano Tong Chin. Try it. Wagarano Tong Chin. And what that means is, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you can approach it from any particular manner. And I learned this from a 16-year-old boy in, in Korea who was our tent mate. What we did is we had the pilots living in tents. <coughs> And these were squad tents that were about as big as from you know, this part of the room, a little short. And uh, we would sleep there and uh, spend maybe an hour or so playing a game of chess occasionally. And that's about it. But we had a Korean boy uh, that would come around and he would, uh, he lived locally in the village, and he would take care of our tent. And I ended up to be the guy that was in charge of it. And I had the feeling he didn't like me. Uh, but uh, anyway, we sat down a little bit, and I taught him a little English, and he, he, he taught me some Korean. And uh, one day, we were ready to leave. And uh, I told Kim, guess what his name? Every male, <laughs> I think every other male in Korea is called Kim. It's, it's a very common name. But anyway, I said, Kim, we're going to be leaving tomorrow. No response. That morning, I said, Kim, we'll be leaving about 2 o'clock this afternoon. So, uh, it would be very nice to see you and you taught me some things. Still no response. We just figured, well, he didn't like me, so yeah. So, about noon, we were packing our gear, and all of a sudden, he came up and threw his arms around me and he started crying. Oh. And that was a surprise to me. He didn't figure out what he wanted. He was 16 years old. He had spent a grand total of 30 days in his family school. He was 16. He was a very sharp little guy. He was little, smaller than I was. But anyway, uh, he wanted to go to school, to go to school. He was delighted. And that's why he wanted to go back. He said, take me with you. Take me with you. So these are the things today that makes Korea, South Korea, so fabulous. Now, I haven't been over there, but a number of guys that I flew with have, have been over there on these trips, paid for by the Korean government. And they have all come back with this conclusion, that the Korean, South Koreas are very appreciative of what we do, because it has completely changed that country. Now they are one of the real economic uh, giants in the world. The South Koreans, not all. Well, anyway, in flying from in, in Korea compared to World War II, there's a tremendous difference. We had 15 pilots from our squadron here flying in Korea. Nine of them did not return. That's a 50% loss. Over we never had anything like that in World War II. Do you want to say anything on that? Well, anyway, so it was a rough time. And for me, it was especially rough for this reason. I wore these caps all in World War II and all of Korea. We never got our hard hats on until we got jets back here in Minnesota. These earplugs here are not good. So right now, I have a loss of at least 75% of my hearing because of poor insulation on the ears. But I know from uh, Daryl here 
this year, here in the Zeeman, I think worse than mine. But every <laughs> single pilot that flew propeller-driven airplanes are hard to hear, without exception. I haven't found a single one. And so be patient whenever you're dealing with them. And if at the end of the program, when you have questions, speak up good and loud. That's all I ask. Well, I just said a few things here that uh, might be of interest to them. We'd like to open it up uh, for questions, if you, any of you have any questions. Um, I brought a few things here that uh, might be of interest to you. One thing that we have to do is we have to define some of the words. For example, you see this picture here with four aircraft. That's a division in aviation. That's a division of fighters. Now, if you're talking about a division on the ground troops, in the 1st Marine Division, there were 17,000 men. So the word division is very confusing uh, to many people. Now, we were, uh, this, these airplanes here are all part of a Marine Division. Now, I was in BMF 214. Darrell was in BMF 312. Each squadron has a different designation. And BMF means V is for aviation, M is for marine, and if there's an F on the end, that means fighter. If there's an A on the end, it's an attack plane. If it's a B, it's bomber. So you can look at it immediately, and it gives you the perspective on really what you're dealing with. So um, that's what we're doing. All of these people that signed this along the way here are all Korean, are all, uh, of course, are pilots. And unfortunately, most of them are not alive anymore. Daryl and I are the only two people that were flying over the Chosen Reservoir from this area. We're the only ones alive here. Now, I talked to one guy yesterday uh, by phone, and that's this guy right here. who got the Congressional Medal of Honor in, in Korea. Uh, Tom Hudner, maybe you've heard of him. But anyway, he, is, he and I are exactly the same age. Uh, so, uh, anyway, we have a little bit in common. But uh, i just tell you this story because it's, uh, it's, it has a lot of background information. President Truman gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, and uh, one of these planes up here was our group. We were flying the, we were flying the protection for them while they were doing this. It was in North Korea. It was at the Chosen Reservoir. And, uh, we were uh, there in November and December of 1950. It was one of the real classic challenges to human uh, activity that we've ever had. The temperature dropped to 30 below zero. Have you ever tried to repair an airplane engine at 30 below zero with no protection at all? Okay, we did it. The, the reel of people that should have had far more uh, 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 for far more applauses were the people that were taking care of those airplanes. They were working with spark plugs, they had to keep off the gloves. It was very hard to screw the plugs uh, with gloves on. And uh, in order to keep the engines warm, uh, we had to run the, run the engines at night because there was no APU units to heat the engines up for cold weather survival and cold weather operation. So the people that really has should have had far more uh, far more pats on the back than got the people that kept these airplanes going. Now, Tom Hudner uh, on this episode here was flying off the aircraft carrier Leyte, and he and his wingman was Jesse Brown, the first black naval aviator. Uh, Jesse was shot down. Black. Had, uh, and so what he did was he had to stay with, he stayed with the airplane, which was good, and he belted the airplane in. Now this is, look at this background. See all the mountains here? The Chosen Reservoir is just over this piece here. It's about maybe 15 miles, actually. It's still in the reservoir area. Uh, Jesse Brown was shot down, and uh, he stayed with the airplane, and unfortunately his plane started to burn. Now, Tom Hudner was circling him, and they were in radio communication. Jesse was on the ground, but he couldn't move because his leg had been hit, had been hit in the side of the airplane, and he couldn't move. And he was also bleeding badly. So anyway, uh, Tom Hudner got on the radio and asked for help. 
and that's when we got into it. And uh, we were just about uh, 12 miles away, so we hurried over to where he was and we started circling because this area here was all controlled by the North Koreans. So our job was to keep the North Koreans away while Tom was trying to get help for the thing. What he did was he crashed his airplane in alongside two Corsairs now crashed. Now there's a little problem because if you crash your airplane by your decision, it can be a court martial thing. Well, some of us knew this. And uh, we talked about it when we went back down, and several of us wrote letters immediately to the defense department that he should not be court martialed for this because he, he, he did this to help another person. And anyway, what turned out from a court martial went to the Navy Cross, the Navy Cross went to the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. And he deserved it. I talked to him yesterday morning. He lives in Massachusetts, still doing okay at uh, 89. And uh, so I said we're going to celebrate our many birthday together. So. <laughs> but anyway, he deserved a real plug. So um, we have things come up all the time as far as you know what's good or what isn't good. But here's an example. Uh, very famous uh, activity. Um, our job, as we were circling here, was just to keep the North Koreans away, and so we had to use our 20 millimeter cannons and our wings to do some. Uh, uh, some spraying if we saw any people in this area because it was all under North Korean control. We didn't have any, any Marines in the 1st Marine Division until we got a little top of the mountain. So, um, anyway, that's what I wanted to just mention. Now, I wanted to go back a little bit um, because uh, I was, I just finished uh, college and uh, this was in 1949. And uh, I was in graduate school, and the Korean War broke out on June 25, 1950. But I had to selected to a new job. The new job was to run an aerial crop spraying outfit. And so we were out west spraying uh, crops of various types, mostly uh, for insects. And uh, I was not happy with it because. One morning I went out and I sprayed and I went back to the field that I sprayed and I walked through it. And after I found that litter of baby pheasants, all of them writhing on the ground, knowing that the spraying that I did was responsible for them in that particular situation, I made a decision I was going to quit. And it was paying very well. Very well. Uh, so uh, that afternoon I still carried out my commitments and that's when I got overcome the parathion. I don't know if you've ever heard of that poison, but you might have heard it about in the news because 300 people in Mexico died of parathion poisoning when some of the parathion got involved in the flour that they were using for bread. So, very good toxic material. Well, anyway, so I came back and I, I, I told the boss I was quitting. That is hot because if the pilot came, that meant an airplane. So to so send an airplane back with me to get all the way back to Iowa. I'm, I'm from Iowa. I was flying out of the Kings, Iowa. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I quit the job. I went and took care of my father, who was in very bad shape in the Iowa University. And uh, then the Korean War broke. Just bing, bing, bing. So I, it couldn't have happened at a better time as far as I was concerned. So anyway, our squadron here in Minneapolis went to, to San Diego. We spent a week there, and Zing went to Japan, and then found out some other things about the military. Three of us were put in communication officers. Now, all the things that you want to be in, you don't want to be in communication. For this reason, if you screw up, you don't just get a court martial. You end up in, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas prison. It's just sort of automatic because if you screw up in, in communications, they go all over the world. We have to change all of our wheels for, for a, it's a very expensive operation. Moral of the story, don't screw up. Now that takes a two-year special course. I didn't have that. Three of us got in that. Jim, Bill Holden, uh, uh, Don, uh, uh, 
my name is Joe Cumberland, and I'm working with the three of us were in there. So I thought, there's only one thing to do, we got to complain to our right to the commanding general. Well, if we, get, if we screw up, it's going to be your neck as well. Generals don't want that. In three days, we were in squadrons. <laughs> but we were put in squadrons because that was our job. We could all fly, and we all had a great deal of experience. So we all ended up in 214. That's a squadron, it's a fighter squadron. And if you remember that book, Baba Black Sheep, it's all about the Black Sheep Squadron, and uh, that's the squadron in. But uh, of course, it's a different personality, uh, and so that's how I got it. So the first thing was that uh, Daryl's squadron and our squadron ended up in Monsan, North Korea, and from there, after a couple of hops, uh, we ended up in a little place called Yanpo. Yanpo was way up in North Korea, and it had a, it had a, a, a runway on it, uh, a couple of buildings. They had wonderful living quarters. They had a big cement building, and it wasn't right. a single window in the building, so it just liked to be outdoors. I sort of liked that. The thing was, it was quite below zero. And we did have sleeping bags, so that was pretty good. But uh, anyway, uh, that's what we learned. The reason was because in Marine Corps aviation, you want to be as close to the battle as possible. The 1st Marine Division was going up a road. You all see this? This is done by a very complex, uh, complex uh, uh, artist who uh, is very good at this. You see that. This is the Korean country. Uh, this is the 38th parallel here. We were right uh, here at uh, Yanko, so we were that far into North Korea. Um, you might remember that uh, the Chinese decided to get an operation just about that time. So they sent a small force of about 300,000 people, men, into this area. And they came down this way with part of it, and they came down part of it over here. Here's where the 1st Marine Division was, and that was the unit that we were mostly concerned with. The 1st Marine Division went up this very uh, curvy, mountainous road into this area here, right in Weber, New Damney, Tiger Roo, and so on. And that's what, and so we were this far apart. We were very close. It's a big advantage in, in, in aviation for supporting the ground troops. We call it CAS. CAS, Combat Air Service, Close Air Support. So anyway, that's what we did. We were there to protect, help the 1st Marine Division as much as possible. There were 17,000 of them there, surrounded by a good part of the 300,000 Chinese had put in there, plus the uh, North Koreans. So that was our, that was our job. Um, Daryl Squadron, and our squadron were both at Yonko. And uh, the weather was not very cold. Not only was it cold, but also some of the ceilings, we refer to the clouds, the level of the clouds above, as ceilings. And our ceilings were down sometimes as low as 200 feet. One day, I'll just cite this one case, one day there were only two of us that could get our plane started. Corsair is not an easy airplane to start, especially when the temperature is down below zero. We got two airplanes started out of the unit, out of the 18 that we had in the squadron. So uh, the problem was we got out and taxied out and looked at that ceiling, which is 400 feet. Now we're taking off here and we're flying up through the mountains, up this little mountain path, uh, to help the 1st Marine Division that was scattered for about seven. 10 miles all the way along this road. We uh, we got up we got we got up there and we started. Uh, now this is another thing. The airplane with the rockets on. We had my plane had had, had 500 pound bombs. Uh, and the other guy's plane was rockets. So we put the guy with rockets first because you don't want if you're any chance of sitting behind you don't want the guy with rockets there because uh, the rocket there in the airplane was a little damaged. So anyway, that's what we found. I followed him up this, this, this road, and in order to, to stay below the ceiling so we could see, 
And in order to make the curves on this road, we had to fly with 30 degrees of flaps down with 2,400 RPM. Anybody can go to the engines. It's a high, high power study. We flew all the way up in this area, and we ended up asking for the air controller to come on. We have some communications to get that. The air controller came on. Now remember this name. It's called Dunkirk 1-4. Dunkirk 1-4. That was his call. That's the air controller's call. We cannot do anything unless he approves it because of the proximity of friendly troops. So we got him here. And the guy first thing said, oh, God, we're glad to see you here. Because we were the first airplanes to get to uh, so uh, I said, if you can find targets for it right away so we can get rid of these bombs, 500 pound bomb, three of them under each one, we only had six of them. That's multiply that, that's like it takes a tremendous amount of fuel to keep that airplane going. So I asked him if he could pinpoint down what you need to get rid of those bombs and rockets first, we'll be able to stay on, 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 the, on, on course uh, around the area here. And the, and the Chinese and North Koreans do not like airplanes over there because we also have some interesting little stingers out here on the, on the wings called 20 millimeter cameras. Wonderful for uh, helping friendly troops. Anyway, so he calls and he says, yes, we have, we have mortars. And that was one of the chief arms that, he brought, that the Chinese brought with them because they were easy to handle. And they said, and there's a group of trees here that the mortars are coming from, if you can hit those, that would be really perfect. Okay? So, so I, I peeled off and I got over the trees, uh, and jumped around the, the, uh, the ceiling, is at, is at 400 feet before it's dropped down to about 350 now. Um, and we have a squadron policy that said you no know, bombs drop below 1,000 feet. Well, that doesn't work because we have to be able to see the ground. So anyway, I flew over the trees and uh, they can be. The controller said, that's it, right there, right underneath you. I looked down and I could even see a couple of people involved. They wore white uniforms, and they, but they weren't pure white. They were sort of a yellowish, and they, stand, they stood out against the snow, uh, even though they were standing against trees and so on. So anyway, I figured out, OK, so I, now I have another problem. With only uh, 350 feet of ceiling, and dropping 500 pound bombs, sometimes what happens is pieces come up the ground and explode from the airplane. They're embarrassing. <laughs> so I figure, well, I have to do the next best thing. I'll have to open the canopy, get everything all set up, and start picking these bombs. Just bing, 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 like that. And then dive for the ground. Because the ground is being is like this. And so if you, if you look at the topography, you can come over and dive this way so the bombs go off. The, the heels here will protect you a little bit. It works, and it worked for me. So I dropped, I dropped six, pound, uh, six bombs right in that area, and then got out of there and didn't do any damage to the plane. Anyway, so then we circled for the rest of the day. We stayed there for three hours, just circling, circling. And, and, and all the enemy wanted to do was to stay out of sight. So we were helping them uh, in that manner. That was in the daytime. However, at night, it's much more difficult. We did have some night fighters, but it doesn't help a lot uh, when they're fighting something like this. So this was a fabulous activity uh, with, uh, 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 to try to control the enemy so that the friendlies could get out. And uh, they did get out. They did make it. Um, maybe I'm going to stop right now. Any questions on this part? Anything? Yes, ma'am. Why? Why is it that they wanted to not drop bombs lower than 1,000 feet? Well, because the bomb, when the bombs go off, it, it explodes some things up and it might hit oh. the airplane. And it's very, that's why I opened the canopy. Right. So if the airplane was uh, in any way hit, I could always bail out the last minute. 400 feet to be my time. OK, any other question? Well, yes, sir. Why, uh, in a situation like this, uh, would there not be enemy fighters. You had no enemy fighters. No enemy fighters. They didn't have any air. We had control of the air. Oh, you had control yeah, of the air. Oh, I understand. All right. The only thing the other enemy had was mates. And they were up high. We didn't have to worry because we were underneath the, the canopy of the, of the clouds. So we, they couldn't see us anyway. 
repeat. So there's, each situation is a little different. And now, if it would have been clear, then we would have been concerned about the MiGs. And we were jumped by MiGs a couple times. Uh, and one of the guys in Corsair sure shot down MiGs so many times ever happened. Okay, yes. Aren't MiGs Russian planes? Yes. They were Russian planes flown by Russian pilots. Oh. As far as we know. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, cool. That's uh, Daryl, do you want to say anything about the... Yes, I would wonder if I could... Good and loud. ...on uh, uh, Russian yeah. We were talking about close air support, and the Marines had developed this tool. Uh, the Chinese came in, they came in 300,000 strong. MacArthur is saying they're not there, they're not there. He's back in Japan. And as for the close air support, we had that in our plane. The key was the forward air controller that was on the ground with the ground people. He had to be a pilot so that he knew what we could do to help him and what we couldn't do. And on one mission, I'll just describe it. Forward air controller asked us whether I shouldn't have to know that there was just one road going up in those mountains. No other way out. And we performed a convoy. And literally, they claimed they didn't return. They turned around and advanced a different direction trying to get out of here. But the uh, former air controller on this particular farm asked me to come down from the hills on the side and go up to where the Chinese were dug in at the top. And, and, uh, so we never made a run and fire until the forward air controller on the ground and checked and said, yes, you're on the right, right target. Anyway, as we came down, we got, we got in a, had to get in a tail chase so we, we, wouldn't, we could see each other and we got to have a collision on the ground. And, uh, they had me come down right over the top of the convoy. They was trying to get this way. And then they up, up where the Chinese were in the hill on both sides, actually. And they, they had to clear the top of those hills to get the convoy to move. And the Chinese were constantly putting up roadblocks and stopping the convoy. Well, they had it stopped. <laughs> and he told me what, what I should do. So there were four of us in that flight. I was the third one. And as they came down, and we all started up and we started firing. We had six 50 caliber guns in that airplane, three in each wing. <laughs> and, uh, when we came down there, well, I noticed it came from point of the sun. Uh, I should say, our standard program was when we made our runs, and then the ground people came through. Uh, I came, came up and I looked down and I got these guys were running right under them. And, uh, I noticed also that at the plane ahead of me, every time he started firing, these people, these Marines that were trying to get up the set hill to clear it, would duck down like this. 
what the hell was their helmet? And I couldn't understand what, what in the world they were doing that for us until I talked to them when they got out. And they said, when we came down, right over to the top, and started firing our six caliber, 50 caliber guns. The shells were coming out of the bottom of the wing. And they said they were not only hard, they were hot. And so that's why they were uh, them. But that was the kind of close air support that we were doing. And I'm sure the same situation was repeated many times. It was a long ways out of that room. And uh, then the one other thing I should do first is that uh, Okay, I want to interrupt. Okay. Did you mention anything about, for example, a couple of times when we had our friendlies and the unfriendlies only about 100 feet apart. And that's where close air support really comes in. Did you mention anything about the fact that you shoot only one, one side of the guns? Did you mention anything about that? For example, if, if you're following somebody down the way here and uh, you have Chinese or unfriendlies over here and friendlies over here, you have wing guns on, you want to be very careful with them because when you shoot, what happens? It pulls the air, if you're shooting in the right wing, the right guns, it pulls the airplane this way. So if the friendlies are on that side, you want to be very careful because you can pull the other guns right into the friendlies. So you have to be very cautious on using uh, weapons in that, in that particular manner. Now, um, I just have this book handy that uh, some of you have probably have heard about, Green Wings. Two of us, along with 20 other guys, were, wrote this book. And what we did is we just took some of the highlights that we did in the past, put them all together in the book, and uh, we did this uh, in 07. And uh, we, we sold out the first batch and had to get them reprinted. Just about finished with that in the second reprint. But anyway, they uh, turned out to be great. So Daryl and I are both in there. And uh, I brought a few of those books today, if any of you are interested. Okay. Um, any questions at this point on anything that Carol has that Carol mentioned? Well, that was our uh, enlisted people back at the field. It was down below zero. And all the work was done outside. There was no building to make it to take them at all. kept us going. And I can remember day, days when I made about uh, four, four or so flights during the day. I flew my mission, came back, and sat right down beside the airplane until we got it rearmed and, and uh, refueled, and then went right back up to, to, to the uh, but, but these guys, almost impossible conditions to get those airplanes going. Never believe the guys that help the most. You might have something else to uh, mention later on. I want, to, I want to get into the survival aspects of the aviation. Uh, why don't you go ahead and sit down and I'll uh, get it in for you. Um, I was our survival officer for our squadron because I had always had an intense interest in surviving. Uh, when I was in high school, two of us went out and we survived for a full week. We didn't take anything with us. We had five things. We had a sleeping bag, uh, some, some uh, safety pins for books and for fishing. Uh, we had a flashlight. We had a knife. That for us. Uh, yeah, people thought we were nuts because we were doing this. We survived very well. 
Uh, we were hungry most of the time. But anyway, uh, so uh, this uh, followed me, and then another guy and I went through the famous, uh, uh, famous uh, storm uh, in uh, November of 11th of 1940. Remember that called the Armistice Day storm. Uh, it's in the middle of that in Iowa. I was duck hunter. And uh, so, so anyway, I've been always very interested in survival. Well, if you bail out in an airplane, you better have some plans ahead of time. And that's why, it's because Daryl was one of the few people that had done this. So I'm going to ask him to put his two cents worth in on this. But if you have a cap on like this, you bail out, and it's 20 degrees below zero when you bail out, and you lose your cap, your helmet, whatever it is, you're in trouble. Unless you have some fear, because you can survive the landing, okay, but then you have to survive in the cold. So what I did is I devised this thing so that guys could put this underneath their flight suit. An extra pair of gloves, an extra cap, and this had a face mask on it, this is not one. And an extra pair of socks, and you can put all that right here in protection underneath your flight suit. So when you bail out, that stuff will be there for you upon landing. Because we had several records where guys had bailed out and they didn't make it because they weren't prepared for a cold. And cold is terrible. It really is when you're not ready for it. If you're ready for it, it makes a big difference. So anyway, that's what uh, I just wanted to say. That, uh, this was part of my job over there to make sure that everyone was well uh, briefed and uh, well handled as far as uh, survival goes. Now, Daryl, why don't you mention one thing when you bailed out? Because you had a very close call. You want me to tell the story? No, 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 tell the whole story. I don't know, just do the highlights of it. <laughs> uh, well, then I missed the first one. Why don't you get up in front because they can't hear you if you're talking to yourself. Can you stand up? Yeah. Okay, now, what was the question? Lyle. <laughs> Well, you bailed out. Yeah. You had a very close call. What was the? Why? How did you? Why did you make it? And, and compared to somebody who maybe wasn't. I was trying to make it short, but I was flying off the carrier at the time, and uh, was assigned with another pilot. I had a wingman with me, two of us, up to third. Over the carrier, which was basically was a milk run. It didn't have any, any opposition up there. And it, it can actually get tired of what that motor wasn't up there. But on this case, uh, I, I was leading, and I felt just a small vibration start in that airplane. And that sets you right straight up in the back because if you don't fall over the side of the road, this, this thing's going to stop running. Uh, we, we, I was at about 12,000 feet, which is um, quite a little car. And uh, it, 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 it kept getting Stronger and stronger, and the motor was cutting in and cutting out. And it was twisting as long as that airplane was about this far. And I was still stiff and was going to pull the motor right out. And I, so I just pulled back. Uh, it set us about 35 miles chasing uh, another airplane just to give us something to do, basically. So I was, I was about 30 miles away from the carrier. But uh, so I pu pulled the throttle all, almost all the way back to try to, to try to keep this down. And we got to back to the carrier over at about 6,000 feet. I did it just a long drive, basically. And I always thought if I got a, a little water, I'm trying to bail it out. I'm trying to make the water land. 
You mentioned 12,000 feet. Now there's something you might comment about. The highest that I ever got in Korea was 7,000 feet. We fought in World War II, we were high altitude a lot of times. Uh, in Korea, it was always low. We were flying as low as 200 feet many times. It made a big difference in our losses. Flying low is much more dangerous. Yeah, but somebody went to the I realized that I was over the fleet and I was afraid if I bailed out there. He was even thinking me to bail out. He said, you're under fire underneath us. And that stopped me. He thought he had water and I was afraid he did like an aquarium. So I knew I had to bail out. And, uh, he was telling me about the helmets. I opened the, the hatch. Before I could my gut was up, the oil came through. I was just about going to do it. I couldn't see much, but I could sense things. And I also would have been told if you ever bail out, take the switch, because it didn't like start a fire or whatever. You want to start a fire down there. And, uh, over the ocean, but I took the switch just because I had to do that. And, they, and I had it trimmed so it would fly by itself. And, and when I cut the turn of the engine switch, I cut it off. It just went like this. I couldn't realize, I, I knew I could feel the speed picking up, but I couldn't see anything. But, uh, and I was waiting, I could hear the airplane. They said, don't cut that chute. In fact, now I've been just blown out of the sight of the airplane. Now. Coming out, I went out, blown, blown right out of here. And, uh, I was waiting for the airplane sound to go away. I didn't want to pull the chute. Voice, and you gotta go with me because it sounded like it was about 15 feet out in front of me or something falling. And it said, Oh, I report now! And so I did. The chute opened and it slowed me down, but I hit the water so hard I was not so conscious of that. And, uh, but the water was cold, and I came to it almost right away. I could see light up above, so it was going to be okay. And then I, I had radio with the carrier, and they said that my rescue helicopter was on the way. And uh, so I got, I got it came to the surface, but I was having trouble being afloat. I was thinking maybe it was heavy boots and things. What I didn't know was that the really was buttons that they could call didn't, didn't work. They said they knew some of them would, would work, but some of them would. Uh, so they would put, put them up. If they had just told us that, we could have blown it up manually by that street. But uh, I didn't know. Well, anyway, yeah, I look up and I see that helicopter coming and I think I got it made down. It went right over past me. They didn't see me at all. And I thank God for my wingman. He came right down with me and he called him back. And I got, and I... Can I address you as lucky from now on? <laughs> yeah. And you, this, this is one of the, uh, I've talked to a number of pilots. I never bailed out. I don't have any desire. But anyway, uh, Daryl had that experience, and he came out of it very, very luckily.
So anyway, and thank you for relating well, that to I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the reason why. It took me 50 years to figure out that that voice that they had been nothing but the guardian angel. Yeah. It's just, uh, people tell me, oh, you're this easier than the God of the actions. I know I didn't do it, anything. If I had a hit the water, I would have been up. I want to get in another another aspect of this thing because I think it's important. Um, I carried binoculars with me all during World War II in Korea. And I carried them because I'm a nut on birds. <laughs> so this was a distinct advantage because I could fly at high altitude and one of our jobs in World War II was to stop the kamikaze from coming in and hitting our ships. And so we had to hit those islands that they were using for repair spots and so on and uh, resting spots. So we could sit at 25,000 feet out of range of their any aircraft and I could sit there with binoculars and pick out things that uh, were very helpful. Our division got credit one day for hitting 40 air, getting 40 Japanese airplanes in one spot because I had picked out from scanning from almost a mile away from the field I just happened to see a little edge and it looked like the leading edge of an airplane. So I watched that as we made the circle, because our job sometimes was just to circle and make sure that there were no planes coming in, so I could get a different view uh, from different perspectives. With no question, that was an airplane. So we had a guy by the name of Major Frame, who was our division leader, and I was the little old man on the totem pole, so I was way in the back in Charlie. And I told him that and they couldn't see it, so he turned the lead over to me. And I had rockets that day. Uh, each airplane was a little bit different. But anyway, uh, so we went down and we started hitting and there were airplane parts flying everywhere. So the photographers came in afterwards, took pictures of it, and they pieced it together and they said there were 40, at least 40 airplanes involved in it. And our division got credit for the 40 airplanes. But it was a pair of binoculars that did it. Now, I used this several times also in, in Korea. So birding sometimes pays dividends uh, in other areas besides just the birds. Uh, I thought maybe you might uh, be interested in that as well. Any questions at this particular point? Hey Lyle, yes. would you mind, speaking of birding, would you mind telling about your recognition test? I love that story. It's in your book, your recognition oh. test that you got part part of the world. Okay, all right. Um, I was in pre-flight in Iowa City. And one day, a, uh, the, the, the uh, guy that was in charge of our platoon said, mm -hmm. Bradley, they want to see you upstairs in this room. Mm -hmm. I said, what about? He said, I don't know. I was just in a lowly cadet and, uh, and went up. There was a guy at the door. I told him why I was there, took me inside. And then I saw three lieutenant commanders and a full Navy commander all there in full dress. They were convening a, 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 uh, a, we had a name for it, but, uh, deposition. deposition, but then I, there was a special name for it. Well, they said, the commander opened up and he says, do you know that it is a court-martial offense to cheat on tests? Well, that was an interesting thing. I, I had I not done any testing. He said, and so I just said that, I was surprised. He says, how do you explain the fact that you get perfect scores on these tests? I said, well, I don't know. What they were is they would flash. We had to know every single airplane of every country that was at war at that time. And the, and the, and the image would be flashed on the screen at a hundredth of a second. So if you weren't watching, you could miss it. But anyway, one of them, I was getting all of them right all the time. And they thought that was very suspicious. So, you know, so anyway, uh, I said, I have not been... I've been cheating. He says, let's see. But they had 50 new slides that I hadn't seen before. They flashed them on. I got them all right. One of the lieutenant commanders who was there had my file. It already was that thick. And uh, he said, now, just a minute. He said, I see these letters in here from his biology teacher in high school, this minister, uh, neighbors. So all of them say something about he is so good on birds can recognize all these different birds, you know. Maybe he is so sharp at, at recognizing individual feathers even on birds 
Maybe that's why he's so good at recognizing airplanes. That's what they decided on. I never heard another word from it. But in my file in Washington that I checked a number of years later, there was that much of that space that was all devoted to that thing that people were arguing about. So anyway, that's the thing. Okay. Uh, any other questions that you have? Yes, sir. Were the, were the Corsairs all carrier-based? No. As a matter of fact, at first, the Navy did not want the Corsair on the carrier. Uh, the British were ahead of us. The British were using carriers uh, on their, uh, were using the Corsair on the carriers, and we did not want them. The Navy is different. The Navy says, I don't want to scratch on any one of our ships. And sometimes airplanes scratch it. So, now I hope some of you are, if you're lovers of the Navy, I, I, I love the Navy too. They are very sensitive. Now, the Corsair had some problems. I, I have one back there. Uh, you know what Corsairs look like? Here's a nice picture of, of one of them. And uh, the fabulous airplane. I, uh, I feel so lucky that I ended up uh, spending a, a, about at least 2,000 hours in the airplane. I even slept in the Corsair once. We used to have to spend time out on the, out on the air, air, airfield and be plugged into the tower so that if there were any enemy planes coming down, we could take off immediately. And uh, so I even fell asleep in there. So uh, and some other guys complained that. But anyway, I, uh, I just want to mention something about them. Uh, uh, you never know when you're dealing with aviators what you can pull out of the bag. This is a Corsair that I've used for, when I talk to kids. And of course, one of the things that kids like is they like to see how strong the propeller is. So the propeller is missing in this one. But uh, anyway, if this is the carrier here, and I also have a carrier in the car, but it's a little large to bring in, and I didn't have any help at the time. If that's the, if that's the carrier, when a Corsair comes in, you've got to keep that, that, that LSO uh, landing signal officer is a guy that knows all the airplanes on the carrier. He knows their speeds, he can direct them very carefully. So he's standing there, and once you get that airplane set up with your, with your power setting, uh, your flaps and everything, then you concentrate on it. He does the flying. So he gets you coming around here like this, and you notice we're turning all the time so that you can see him very clearly. If you get your nose this way, your nose blocks him off. And that was the problem that the Navy did not like. See, the F6F is different because you can look right over the over the uh, nose collie and you can see in front of it. Corsair is different. That's why they didn't want the Corsair. So anyway, Corsair. Well, oh, I, uh, I don't know. I suppose uh, I, I made well over 100 landings on carriers. I suppose uh, Daryl did the same thing. Uh, sorry. That's a, an engine collie. It's normally not that small. But, uh, anyway, uh, so uh, the Corsair, I think, is a beautiful airplane to carry uh, Never had a problem with them, never had an accident with them. Want to say anything on that? Okay, good. That's it. All right. Any other questions? Did, did you launch the CAT? Yes. Yeah, we had probably CATs, we used CATs maybe almost 70% of the time. Uh, if you were first in line, or one of the first ones, you were always kept up. But if they're finally you got enough room, well, then you can take off regularly. Of all the people that I have ever seen on this earth, the, the uh, aircraft carrier teams are the best as far as team members. I don't think there's anything best. The only thing that would be close to it is if you get a bunch of doctors operating on room of an operation. Two cases there of a really good team. So that's yeah. okay, any other questions? Okay. Just about finished. Who's the next person? You're, you're next to boy, I don't want to argue with you. <laughs> I'd end up in second best. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you.